Blackstone Institute has assembled a formidable panel of experts to discuss the issue from a diverse set of perspectives. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce them. We've got Onika Makwakwa, who leads the multi-stakeholder engagement across Africa for the Alliance for Affordable Internet. The Alliance focuses on advancing good practices in policy and regulatory frameworks for affordable access to broadband. Onika is a consumer, civil, and digital rights advocate. She has managed and pioneered various national and international campaigns and policy change processes for women's rights, civil rights, consumer rights, and media and digital transformation initiatives. Onika, thank you and welcome. We're also joined by advocate Teliso Tipanyane, uh, who is the chief executive officer for the South African Human Rights Commission. Teliso spent over 13 years in the SAHRC as head of research. He was mainly responsible for the monitoring of economic and social rights and access to information rights before becoming the chief executive officer. Chelisu has written extensively on human rights issues and was admitted as an advocate of the High Court of Lesotho and South Africa. Lazola Kati is the national campaigner on communication rights for the Right to Know campaign. She is a pan-Africanist and African feminist and an activist who believes that access to the internet is a fundamental right. Lazola holds a bachelor's degree in social sciences, majoring in political and international relations. She also has a postgraduate diploma in political and international relations with a specific focus on security studies and diplomacy. Martin van Staden is the head of legal at the Free Market Foundation and editor-in-chief of the Being Libertarian LLC group of classically liberal publications. He has published articles in academic journals and several books, including a 2017 book titled The Real Digital Divide, South Africa's Information and Communication Technologies Policy. Martin is pursuing a master's degree in law at the University of Pretoria. I am Jan Vermeulen. I'm an investigative journalist focused on, on the technology sector and editor at large for my broadband. I have the honor of moderating our panel discussion tonight. This evening was made possible by the hard work of the team at Cornerstone Institute in Cape Town. To kick things off, each panelist will get five minutes for an opening statement, followed by a discussion. We will also be taking questions from the audience during the last 15 to 20 minutes of the evening. So please send through your questions. Uh, I uh, just, uh, I've just heard that Lazola is uh, having connection problems and may not be able to join us for the whole evening. Um, she will join us when possible, as soon as her connection stabilizes. Uh, I think that's quite topical for an evening where we're discussing internet access as a basic human right. So uh, I would like to hand over the floor to Onika. Onika, please take it away and let's have your opening statements. Five minutes, please. Great. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this opportunity uh, to engage with everyone on uh, the importance of the internet as uh, a human right. Um, there could not have been a better time to do this than at this moment when we are technically uh, coming off of home together, as we've been saying, uh, due to uh, COVID-19 stay-at-home orders and uh, lockdowns globally. Um, if anything that has come out of the COVID-19 uh, lockdown experience has been to really expose how much uh, we need uh, and rely on this technology and the access uh, to it. The access to the internet is a fundamental right uh, from, uh, from where I come from. However, when we look at uh, where we are today in terms of connectivity, only half of the world is connected to the internet. And that number uh, becomes even more, um, you know, uh, troubling when we look at the African continent in particular, where we are still at less than 40% of our population being uh, connected online. Yet we've quickly moved to an era where uh, access, and actually for South Africa in, in particular, we are coming from a 67 days when uh, a lot of activity in our lives had to take place uh, over the internet, uh, even though we still had a population of 60% or even more uh, people who could not uh, have access to connectivity. 
uh, what's unfortunate with the lack of connectivity and, and having not gotten to a point where we fundamentally push for everyone to be uh, connected online is that the people and the population that's currently not connected to the internet is likely the population that mostly needs uh, to be online to be able to take advantage of the opportunities to really uh, transform their lives by, you know, whether it's learning opportunities they're tapping into or business opportunities that they are able to access by virtue of being on the internet. And there's various reasons. We can get to this later of you know, why people are still not connected from a lack of infrastructure. But number one reason in a country like South Africa, where we have the infrastructure uh, of connection in most places has been affordability. The United Nations has a standard that uh, the internet should cost no more than 2% of average GNI for uh, one gig of data per month. But the reality of it, that is that one gig of data is really not sufficient for you to have meaningful connectivity on a monthly basis. But also many countries, South Africa included, still are not meeting this basic standard of 2% connectivity. And, and that becomes even worse for populations that uh, live on less than $2 per, per day. And that is those who are on the lower income quantile of our population. So they miss out an opportunity of truly being able to use this for transformation. And I'll just close off by telling a very quick story of a young boy in Pretoria in Atridgeville who used to get in trouble at home because he would walk for kilometers to go and connect to the nearest hotspot. And when he was asked why it's so important for him to be online, his response was that he lives in a shed and when he's online, he no longer lives in a shed. And that just speaks to the opportunity for people to transform their lives and be active citizens in a democracy through being able to be connected to the internet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Onika. That story is is beautiful. And, and when I read it in, in one of your writings, I it, it really hit home for me. Um, it's something that I experienced in a, in a very different way. Obviously, I've had the privileges of, of having uh, not uh, living in a shack, but, but in brick and mortar homes. Uh, for for most of my life, and uh, and so I can't relate to that part of the story. But that that connecting to the internet and being able to be whatever you want to be, you're not limited by your physical shell or your current circumstances. Truly, is powerful. Um, and with that, I would like to hand over to uh, Cheliso Tipanyane. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. And uh, five minutes, please. Chaliso, sorry to interrupt. You are still muted. Unmute, please. Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> uh, thanks, Jen and, and the colleagues. Let me start by saying that uh, in line with uh, what uh, Onika said, that the digital divide uh, in our country and elsewhere uh, is a violation uh, of the basic uh, fundamental human rights. And let me start by uh, building up the case. So. Our own country in terms of section one of our constitution uh, indicates that which are the founding values uh, which inform our countries. And those founding values are human dignity, equality, human rights, but also more importantly, the need for an accountable responsiveness and openness. So already uh, you can see the impact of the digital divide on this point. Then we go back to other issues in the, of, of the rights in, in the Bill of Rights we have the right of access to information. And how do you realize this right without having the tools to uh, uh, achieve this right? So already that's another clear indication that uh, a digital divide uh, is definitely a violation of this right. We all can also talk about the right to dignity and the right to equality and, uh, and then equal enjoyment of the rights in our country. So it is definitely a, a, a violation as, as, as far as we are concerned as a commission and we're trying to rally that it should be recognized as a right, that the right to free uh, access to internet must be a fundamental human right, which is very fundamental in basically enhancing our democracy and promoting human rights. Now, I want to start end by saying that, you know, the most successful, the most stable, and the most prosperous societies in the world are those societies where there are very few inequalities among their people. So our own country already has massive uh, inequalities in terms of wealth, and therefore you can imagine uh, what this uh, divide is going to do 
we have already seen the impacts of this uh, now with the issues around schools. That since uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown began, many privileged uh, learners are able to study from home through e-learning platforms, while millions of our children in informal settlements, in rural areas, have, don't have this access to, this, uh, to these facilities. Now we're going to have exams, uh, metric exams, uh, towards the end of the year. So already it means those who don't have access to this uh, internet are already two months behind, and yet the exam date has not changed. And that's why we're really pushing uh, for this. And lastly, uh, there have been many revolutions in the world, including the fourth industrial revolution. And we know what's going to happen to those who will be left behind. And therefore, it is very vital that when government is already giving support for other things like social grants, a uh, government must provide access to internet as a basic fundamental human right, which we need to advance human rights, but also to strengthen our constitutional democracy because the increasing inequalities in our country threaten the stability of our country. We are seeing now what's happening in the US over the riots. Of course, that's about uh, people being killed and unlawfully. But again, this divides a recipe for a revolution in most of the countries, even not careful. If you recall the Arab Spring, that was also a result of increasing inequalities. We will see already in our country, we have high levels of corruption and inefficiency. So how do our people hold our government to account when they don't have the necessary tools to ensure that you know, there is uh, accountability, there's also effectiveness, there's effective governance in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, you raised a very important point that I think is going to be a central point of argument, at least I, I hope it's going to be, regarding the specific uh, the specific need for free access, uh, because uh, um, one of the things I think that we'll need to hash out right at the beginning is what exactly do we mean by access? And when you said free internet access, I think uh, that set the tone for, for what uh, the discussion is going to be to come. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I see Lazola uh, is online. I'm seeing images uh, from, uh, from her side. So Lazola, I'm going to, without further ado, hand over to you for your opening statement, uh, you have five minutes. Uh, take it away, please. Uh, Lazola, sorry, you are still muted. Please unmute and continue. Okay, can you hear me now? Loud and clear, please proceed. All right, after many internet issues, we are here. Um, thank you very much for having me on this platform um, to have this very important discussion. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I'm gonna follow uh, with definitely the steps with our first two speakers that definitely um, I do believe, and we as a writer do believe that access to internet is a fundamental right. And I think that um, the conversation on access to internet also needs to touch on privilege and class, because we need to remember that access to internet was a privilege that some um, class members of, of, of higher class could uh, actually in, engage in and enjoy. And now the issue is that in this century, in the, in the year 2020, this is a fundamental need. We have people that need to have access to municipal services. We have people that need to have access to educational services and even platforms to learn. So now when we don't have free access to internet, we have the majority of the population, especially in the African context, being totally cut off. And now being cut off from participating in municipal issues, you're also now being cut off from being a right-bearing citizen because you can't participate in democracy. And so now we have a bunch of people that aren't part of South Africa, that don't have their voice actually heard and that can't participate in the country. And so this has to be a big problem. And the way to remedy this, since we are on, on, on a digital um, era and we are on a digital journey, is to make sure that by law and by policy, access to free internet for all is a fundamental right. This, I believe, will push countries like South Africa, um, because Anika already uh, highlighted that South Africa is not actually following up to that um, amount uh, that the UN actually said that countries should be um, charging. So now this will actually push South countries like our very own South Africa and other countries to participate in ensuring that free accessible internet is a fundamental right and is reached for all in their countries and above. 
So um, as an opening statement, I think we agree that it's a very important discussion to have and maybe to even have ways on how to make um, internet accessible, free internet accessible. Definitely. Thank you so much for that. And uh, that is uh, an area I really hope we get to explore this discussion is the nitty gritties of the how. How does one make this happen in, in a practical sense? Because I think a lot of um, a lot of the discussions fall down at the idealism, but there, there must be a way to do it. And let's uh, let's dig into that. Um, and so with that, thank you so much. I'm going to allow Martin van Staden to make his opening statement. Five minutes, please. I should start by saying that there can be no doubt about the importance of internet access. In that respect, I agree with every single speaker that has spoken before me. The internet has revolutionized practically everything and there is no aspect of life that it does not significantly influence today. Everyone should ideally have an unlimited and quality internet connection for a fraction of what it costs today and even more ideally uh, free if, if that could ever be achieved. But we need to be careful to not confuse important things, even extremely important with human rights. The last 500 or so years of human history has been the story of dominated peoples fighting for the recognition of their dignity and liberty by political aristocrats. They did not want luxuries and handouts, but wanted to pursue their affairs without molestation or interference. This was because they recognized that all human beings, regardless of uh, who they were and where they were, were naturally ordained with certain claims. These claims are not provided or supported, but are inherent and obvious and connect to the human person. Simply, these claims are to be left alone if so chosen and to make one's decisions insofar as those decisions or conduct does not violate the very same claims of others. And this might seem unduly theoretical, but it is important to bear in mind that all practical applications of, or are of theories. Uh, and if we get the theory wrong, the application of the incorrect theory would tend to result in absurdities, impracticalities, and we, we need to emphasize impracticality, and even atrocities. Uh, the nature of a human right lays in its inalienability and its universality. Inalienability means that the right cannot be taken away and it cannot be voted away. It attaches to the human person and can never be severed. Universality means that the right is enjoyed by all people everywhere, but it also means that human beings have always had this right for as long as humankind has existed. Both of these requirements for the existence of a human, uh, of a, of a human right of, of necessity means that no right can be created anew. There is no way to create a new human right because if this were possible and dictators and tyrants would rejoice at this idea, then it would be possible to also take away human rights in a, in a legal and justifiable sense. And that's, that clearly violates the principle of, of inalienability. Since the internet, as we know today, has only been around for about three decades, it cannot be said that it has ever been a human right since ancient and historical peoples could never have had a right to something that has only recently been invented. Uh, and if we deem it possible to add internet access to a list of human rights, then we allow for existing human rights to be removed from the same list. Internet access may on the other hand become a legal or a statutory right, but let me stress it can never be a human right. If we want to make it a legal right, then we have to and we must look at practicality. The nature of human rights that I've discussed allows everyone to enjoy those rights equally in every society without exception. But if we start adding human rights in the sense of entitlements that must be provided, then the story changes radically. Suddenly, it will depend very much on how wealthy a specific society is and specifically how much tax revenue a government can collect for it to provide that right to citizens. In South Africa, it is by now well known that tax revenue has been collapsing for government long before the uh, COVID-19 lockdowns began. Uh, our downgrade, for instance, was always on the cards. It's not COVID that triggered it. Um, but COVID has absolutely uh, exacerbated that situation by uh, causing more joblessness and causing multitudes of businesses to close that will no longer be paying taxes. There simply isn't any money to provide internet access to, e to or even most South Africans by the government. For internet access to successfully become a legal, not a human right, it would mean that the government must significantly scale back 
its regulatory apparatus and allow economic growth and production, job creation and entrepreneurship so that in the end, uh, in a few years time, it can collect enough taxes to uh, bring about such a right to internet access. As Talisa says, the most prosperous societies in the world are those with the fewest inequalities. But I would like to add that those are also the societies with the greatest respect for private property rights and free markets and economic freedom. And uh, that is the surest route to ensure our society becomes wealthy enough so that we can practically uh, even start talking about guaranteeing a, human, a, a legal right to internet access. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. And I think uh, that is a great place to kick off the discussion regarding the point uh, of uh, the, the nuance around human, human rights. And, uh, and in some of your writings, you've, um, uh, you've distinguished between them. And, and here you've distinguished between them as sort of inalienable rights and legal rights. And, and previously you've, um, you've referred to them as, for example, rights of entitlement. And I think uh, that's, a, that's a great place to kick off the conversation. And so uh, with that, Chepiso, I, I would like to, um, uh, sorry, Chelizo, uh, I would like to throw the question to you. Um, uh, if access to information, education, and freedom of speech are considered human rights is access to the internet an extension of that let's let's take it from there uh thank you let me just start by saying that you know uh if we go back to the u.s declaration of independence 1776 uh, which is also a very important document despite everything else about the u.s it says that human beings are endowed with the right to liberty freedom and pursuit of happiness. And these three uh, uh, pillars have basically informed the expansion of human rights. So human rights have been evolving and increasing uh, from time to time. Of course, other people might have a, a different uh, view about that. But certainly to your question, yes, uh, to a large extent, uh, like right to water, uh, right to speech, so the internet, uh, rights to internet basically help to facilitate these other rights. That's why, for example, we say the right of access to information is a gateway to the enjoyment of other rights because without information, what can you do? So, so in that sense, you can say, yes, the right of access to internet, free internet for that matter, facilitate uh, the right to access to, to access to information, but then also helps to give effect to other rights. So you can see it as an extension if you want to avoid the argument that we should not be expanding on the basket of human rights. But I'm saying you can expand on, on the basket of human rights because when evolving communities, some of the rights which we didn't have a uh, hundred years ago, we have them now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Oniko, uh, do you have a comment to add on this question? Yes, certainly. I think for me, it's really around the lines of looking at uh, access to the internet, uh, the internet as the utility uh, for us to be able to enjoy this access and rights to information, right? So without it being seen as a, 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 a basic uh, human right, then how are we able to enjoy our right to access to information. But also, I mean, I think we need to also look at, you know, what is a democracy, right? A democracy uh, is, it doesn't exist only because government is there. It exists because the civil participation in that democratic uh, life. So do we want a South Africa where people are empowered and have the means to actively participate in that democracy? And if the answer is correct, uh, that participation actually right now, its, its main gateway is by giving people access uh, to the internet. I, I, I mean, I could uh, respond hopefully later to the whole issue of cost. I think we should have a, a conversation later on around where does the money come from, but I, I really don't Definitely. think that when we talk about rights, we juxtapose the issue of cost. If we say that fundamentally every child has a right to an education, we make sure that we find the resources for every child to have a right to education. And likewise, we would do the same for a right to uh, access to the internet. 
Yes, definitely. And thank you for that. We will definitely come to the, the discussion on the practicalities of it. Um, I, I thought it would be good to, to start discussing um, some of the more philosophical aspects up front, make sure we're all on the same playing field uh, with regards to definitions. And, uh, and then we'll take it from there. Um, and uh, Lazola, uh, do you have something to add on the, uh, on the point of uh, whether uh, internet access should be, an ex should be seen as an extension of the rights to access to information, education, and freedom of speech? I think we literally just lost Lazola as I was asking her the question. Um, uh, hopefully she'll come back and then I'll, I'll put the question to her again. Um, uh, Martin, I'm going to uh, come back to you um, and because it's uh, your uh, opening statement that, that led to this line of questions. Um, and so uh, could it not be argued that uh, it, the, the, the right to ac access to the internet um, should be considered as part of access to information, education, and freedom of speech. I think the point that internet definitely facilitates the exercise of all those rights is certainly true. I think that cannot be disputed, but so does a, uh, a TV broadcast camera facilitate the right in section 16.1 to a press media. So does a podium at a stage facilitate the right to uh, freely uh, express and impart ideas. Uh, there are many facilitators of rights, but they do not become rights in and of themselves. For instance, we do have the right to freedom of expression, but simply because I have this right does not mean that I can now go to government and say, please procure for me a expensive broadcasting camera like those they use to make movies so that I can film my ideas and impart that information to my fellow countrymen. Because that is also a very important aspect of freedom of ex, uh, ins expression. It's a facilitation of that right. But because I am making a claim on the, the, re the resources, the necessarily scarce resources of my fellow citizens uh, through tax money for government to provide that for me, then the nature of what we are talking about is different. Uh, as Chaliso uh, uh, correctly um, uh, pointed out, the Declaration of Independence, for instance, uh, uh, set this thing in motion. What I do dispute is that it did not create rights. I, I do not think that rights are ever created. Either you have uh, human rights, fundamental rights are ever created. You either have them or you do not. And the Declaration of Independence was a state where we finally recognized them for the first time. Uh, but uh, since then, we have discovered this, this distinction between liberty rights and so-called entitlement rights and liberty rights, you simply need to be left alone. And that is the, the, the sphere of where human activity can take place freely, a right guarantees freedom. Uh, and then when we talk about these entitlements, and when I say entitlement, I don't mean to, to belittle it. It is when you, have, you are making a claim on the resources of other people to provide that for you. So there is a a, a significant difference between these two things. But I, on that, I must emphasize and put it beyond question that I agree completely that the internet is extremely important to the facilitation of our rights. And I think as civil society, we should absolutely all work, put our heads together and work towards making internet access more affordable for everyone. But given the reality, given the reality of our scarce resources in South Africa specifically, we need to be careful and we need to be very cautious. Thank you for that. And as a last point um, uh, on, on this more philosophical grounding of uh, what should be considered human rights, um, I, I want to perhaps uh, make an example and so that everybody um, here and, and everybody who is watching us are on the same page. So um, for, we've seen uh, many countries use internet access as a tool for population or information control. Now we've spoken about access to information, education, and freedom of speech as essential human rights. Um, but then we have countries like India, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, Guinea, Egypt, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, Uganda, and Zimbabwe, who have resorted to shutting down 
internet access during protests, riots, or, or other crises. And then uh, you've got, uh, on the other hand, you've got countries like China and North Korea, which control day to day what citizens can or cannot have access to on the internet. I mean, this is a this is a reality we don't even really contemplate in countries like South Africa. I and mean, can you imagine what would have happened in the United States with the protests happening there now? if the, the, the executive were able to just shut off the internet. Um, so uh, I think um, we're all on the same page uh, when we say that, that this is a violation of human rights or, or am I mischaracterizing that? And, um, uh, and if this is a violation of human rights, then at what point do we draw that line of something, uh, uh, internet access becoming a human right versus becoming uh, a, a privilege, uh, for, for lack of a better word. Uh, Martin, I'm going to throw that back to you immediately, and, uh, and then I'll open the, the discussion to the other panelists. Absolutely. I think you correctly note that we're all on the same page on that, and that is in the respect where I say, where I would say, internet access is in fact a human right, but only if conceived correctly. And that means that as a free human being, as a citizen, if you decide to connect to the internet, that is your God-given or your na nature-given right to do so. And the government has no authority, no uh, legitimate authority at least, to take that away from you. And I think this illustrates somewhat uh, well the point that I was making about uh, um, if we conceive of human rights as this somewhat fluid concept where you can add more and where you can take away, and that is, I, I must emphasize that again, if the idea is that you can add, then it must necessarily be that you can subtract. Uh, and that is what we see with many dictatorships, maybe not uh, history, uh, in, in ancient years, but recently where many dictatorships justify what they do in the interests of protecting some nebulous idea of a right. Many times when the internet act, when internet access is cut off, there is talk of protecting the dignity of the president for instance, whereby a president is being insulted. So the, the, digni the human right to dignity of the president is being protected by stopping protests, uh, et cetera. And, and, and stuff like that does happen. And we should not add to that by weakening the moral force of the notion of a human right. We should be clear on what a human right means. And that means those things that attach to your humanity simply because you are human. And I think the answer to that has been clear. And this is the so-called first generation of rights. And uh, it was the first generation. It is the core. And I think that we've added to that has been a conceptual mistake. Uh, but then again, where it is possible to expand welfare services, we can have that conversation, these entitlements. We can have the conversation where it is possible. But we need to get the conceptualization correct in order to enable us to have that conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, throw this open to the other panelists. Uh, Onika, uh, do you have something to add? And I see that hand, uh, Chaliso, I will throw it to you right after this. Onika, do you have something to add? Yeah, so I think I, I just really want to say that, you know, we, we have, to, we at least I hope agree that the internet is a powerful instrument uh, for this century, uh, especially in terms of increasing transparency. Uh, in the conduct of government uh, and, and in enabling people to uh, engage and participate uh, in a democracy. And therefore, for me, if we agree on that fundamental, that is an important and fundamental tool of democracy, then it behooves us to figure out, I think the issues around cost, what you take and what you don't take are the how. So, but if principally we agree that um, we are at a time in the 21st century where access to the internet is a fundamental right, it is uh, not fair that we have children in this country who are not learning while children in other provinces and, and you know, uh, who either go to private school or schools that are digitally based, who are able to continue the same type of education. I believe one of my uh, of the panelists raised this issue earlier on that we currently have a situation where education is digital, and but more than half of the children's nation are not able to learn because of that. So uh, based on that, for me, you know, if education is a fundamental right, uh, access to information is a fundamental right, then access to the internet should equally be a fundamental right. And our job is now to figure out how do we enable it as a fundamental right, as opposed to 
uh, still debating whether it is or not. I'm, I'm not sure, but that's sort of uh, where I am in terms of what I'm hearing at this point. Thank you very much for that. And uh, Chaliso, I'm going to cede the floor to you. Uh, you wanted to add something. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, just back to the philosophical issue. Um, about 100 years ago, uh, the rights uh, of uh, uh, LGBT rights were not recognized at all. Uh, so it does show that uh, human rights do evolve. And human rights, even though they might be endowed uh, by the supreme being, but human, human beings as, a, as part of that democracy do keep on uh, coming up with new rights. That is a, at least that is a school of thought which I come from that you know, will always find ways of giving effect to new rights in order to maximize uh, what the declaration says, our right to liberty, freedom and pursuit of happiness. And secondly, it is the fundamental role of the states. Actually, some people say the only role of a government, of a democratic government, is to give effect to human rights. So where there are weaknesses, the state must fill the gap. Otherwise, then, we'll end up having what uh, uh, it was called by the Constitutional Court, uh, 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 hollow rights, that many of these rights then could be hollow if we don't make sure that they're effective. So you can imagine, we say you have the right to vote, but you must go and buy your own ballot paper. Uh, what, what, how will that mean? So the same thing, you can't have all these rights and then you don't have the tools to give effect to them. So to actually ensure that there are tools, we are saying whether you agree on the issue of rights being evolving or not, but at least we have to agree that without access to internet, these rights will be hollow for many people in our country. And therefore, what is then the point of having a democracy and saying we subscribe, we subscribe to human rights and equality and dignity and all those rights. So we can at least agree uh, as a good lawyer, the, argue, the first argument and the, and the, the alternative argument. Thank you very much for that. And, uh, and I think that uh, has hopefully set the tone um, for the kind of discussion that we want to have tonight is to get at the, at the very core of this issue. And uh, with that, um, I'm gonna uh, first take some reactions from the audience and then uh, ask for, for feedback from the panel before moving on to the more practical, pragmatic matters of, you know, let's say, you know, we, we recognize free internet access as an inalienable right, uh, then what does that mean and, and where do we go from there? Um, so uh, first things first, um, uh, Samantha Arendt posted, Wi-Fi and data like freedom is considered a privilege in South Africa at the same time it has become a necessity in our daily lives, work and school. However, the people who are in dire need of this service are overlooked and rarely considered. Uh, Adam Spires, I'm going to read a whole bunch of these. Feel free to make notes, and, and I'm happy to, to go back to them if you need a refresher when you react. Adam Spires said, if internet access is a human right, are connectable devices a human right? So let's, uh, let's um, make that quite practical. You know, uh, an expensive smartphone or a laptop, uh, or do those become a human right because internet access is a human right? Because what good is internet access if you don't have a device with which to access it? Where does one draw the line? Sorry, Adams, uh, I think I might've put some words in your mouth there, but uh, I'm trying to add context as well. Shireen Orphan uh, said, at what stage should free internet access be implemented when we are unable to adequately address basic survival needs? And, uh, and so uh, things like the right to education have come up a few times. Um, and I, uh, I'm, you know, the, the, the right to, to basic human dignity uh, is, is in uh, the South African Bill of Rights. And, uh, you know, uh, where we have issues where, where uh, there are communities without properly running water and flushable toilets. Um, I think that's a discussion worth having. Uh, David Ferreira says that it certainly is a human right, uh, I, I believe he is trying to say. Society is being pushed to a digital era where you will have to have internet to interact and function in the new normal that society is. We don't have a choice and the ISPs know this. Rene Nguenya said, we have to put this discussion in the context of the current. We have to also address the privileged and the disenfranchised and issues on current unequal distribution of resources, power and privilege. And then Christu Hatung has asks, if someone has to put in labor to produce X, can we say that people have a right to X? Uh, adding a bit to our philosophical discussion. Okay, that is a lot. 
if you need uh, a refresher, I'm happy to go back over some of those points. Um, I'm gonna begin uh, with Onika. Uh, if, if you would like to react to some of uh, the audience's comments, please go right ahead. Yes, certainly. So actually quite interestingly, earlier uh, this week, the Alliance for Affordable Internet and the World Wide Web Foundation, which was actually started by the guy uh, who, who created the World Wide Web, said simply, we actually uh, introduced a standard for meaningful connectivity. Uh, we've had a standard on affordability, which is the one I discussed earlier about the one for two, one gig for no more than 2% average uh, income. So the same way, once we've agreed that uh, access to the internet is a fundamental right, then we need to really come up with a standard for what is meaningful connectivity, right? Because I mean, you could have all the data for free. If all you are doing with all your data for free is going on social media, that may not be the kind of meaningful connectivity that is desirable to create the kind of transformation uh, and, and active participation that um, is desired by uh, this right. So our standard on meaningful connectivity actually talks about the, the uh, adopting standards on minimum speed, adopting standards on uh, what kind of devices uh, are required for that meaningful minimum uh, level of connectivity for individuals. Um, does accessing the internet once a week equal to meaningful connectivity? Or less. And, and the reason for doing this also is that, you know, we've been doing a lot of work uh, around the digital divides, and we are finding that uh, we live in a region in Africa in particular where especially the gender digital divide has been widening. It's not just only about whether people are able to connect online, it's about how they are using their connectivity. We find fewer women are, are using the connectivity to be able to look for jobs, for example, something that we would consider empowering and you know tra tra with potential for transformation. And therefore it, it behooves governments to come up and adopt these standards around making sure that um, that connectivity is not only affordable uh, or free, but also that it is meaningful uh, for the kind of economies. I mean, if you read uh, manifestos of pretty much all of the governments in Africa right now, everyone is talking about the digital economy. Uh, this digital economy is not going to just happen. It's going to happen because you've developed the digital skills that are required to drive the economy. You've uh, made sure that there's a minimum basic uh, skills for people to interact. Um, we are talking about digital IDs. Uh, how are you going to navigate digital IDs? You know, so the same way with education, we had a, a minimum literacy standard of this is what we consider a literate person. So what are those standards on the digital platforms that uh, ensure that everyone has some minimum level of access to be able to enjoy their rights uh, online uh, the same way that they do uh, offline as well? Thank you very much for that. Uh, Chaliso, is there uh, something that you would like to add, a specific question perhaps that you would like to address? Uh, thank you. I, I just want to say, you know, uh, uh, governments have a responsibility uh, to make sure that the interests of their people are advanced. And uh, we are now in the digital economy. So we really need to do everything possible to ensure that, you know, we are not left behind. Uh, and therefore we need to find appropriate standards and methods and mechanisms to ensure that you know, this right is enjoyed. So I just want to say, for example, we are told we lose uh, over 50 billion rands a year due to corruption. So clearly there are other ways in which we could minimize this and then be able to afford what is definitely essential for the growth of our economy, for the strengthening of our democracy, and the enjoyment of human rights. So basically, we have no choice but to join the digital uh, era uh, as effectively as possible as all South Africans and ensure that most South Africans or all South Africans are able to join this highway if we really want to succeed as a country. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, perhaps um, I'm going to throw a couple of specific questions at you. Um, and uh, for, to, the, yeah. to the audience members who did ask questions um, uh, that were not directly answered right now, I will circle back to them uh, towards the end. Um, but a specific question here was, if internet access is a human right, 
are connectable devices a human right? Where does one draw the line? And, uh, and secondly, at what stage uh, should free internet access be implemented when uh, we can't service the basic survival needs of some of the members of our, of our community? You want me to answer that? Yes. Yes, uh, please. Yes, please. Look, um, at some point in time, I see only has got a hand up. The issue of internet should also go with devices, and therefore we need to see, you know, those who don't have devices, uh, how they could be helped, because otherwise it also remains a hollow tool for those who don't have devices. But also uh, in our country, there are still areas where we don't even have uh, internet or proper uh, connectivity. So that also has, has to be addressed. Now, as, the, as far as the issue of uh, the maximum enjoyment uh, of all human rights, of course, that will remain a challenge in our country. There is high levels of poverty and unemployment. So all we're saying is that what is important is that the principle must be recognized and be accepted. Then we work hard towards giving full effect to that principle. And I think this is what we've been doing. So it means we also have to make sure the economy grows properly, there's uh, less uh, abuse of public resources in order to give maximum effect to all those rights. But uh, the uh, uh, access to internet and devices must be part and parcel uh, of this uh, basket of rights, which are required to enhance our societies. And I believe- Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Onika, I see your hand and I'll come back to you now. I see Lazola has put up her hand, uh, digitally speaking, um, and I want to see if perhaps her, her connection has stabilized enough to contribute. Uh, Lazola, I see your hand. Are you able to hear us? And uh, can you, can you uh, please um, uh, add to, to the discussion what you wanted to add? Uh, Hi, um, thank you for giving me that opportunity. Can you hear you me? Are. I can hear you loud and clear. Please proceed. Okay. Um, so basically, just my reactions, especially to the question of how do we then um, address uh, basically coming to a point where we're giving internet access when we can't even do our basic, when we can't even deliver basic um, human rights. And I think um, one of the panelists highlighted this, that if we can deal with the issue of corruption in this country, there is definitely an amount of money that can see us moving to a journey whereby in free internet is actually available as a human right. And I think that's mostly important is that when we look at this kind of question, we need to first look at why aren't we there yet? Why aren't, don't we have access to internet? I think the most important thing we need to start dealing with is corruption. And in actual fact, one of the other things that was highlighted in a report by the Competition Commission, um, the final report on data costs in general, is that um, they highlighted the lack of enthusiasm from the government to actually provide infrastructure in poor communities to be able to have access to internet. So that's another thing that we actually need to, to look at is the appetite of the government to um, provide fundamental rights such as um, uh, access to internet. And I think um, one of the most important questions and, and ways to answer the, the distribution of unequal resources begins there, is that the appetite for the government and for stakeholders that are meant to ensure the realization of fundamental rights, are they doing that job? Then we can start dealing with then which comes first. But I do believe that human rights, a human right that is internet and access to internet can be realized in the same category as what we recognize as the right to life, the right to water, the right um, to fundamental rights, if we can deal with the enthusiasm of the government itself and stakeholders, and especially corruption within this country. Thank you very much for that. And yes, uh, that is uh, a very important point when it comes to uh, ultimately paying for the infrastructure and the data. We, we're definitely going to have to have uh, a discussion uh, about uh, where that money comes from and how to make sure that that money is used uh, in the way that we envision. Um, with, with that, um, uh, Martin, I will come to you right after this. Onika had her hand up. Um, Onika, please, uh, those, uh, I expect that you wanted to speak to those two questions I raised. 
Yes, certainly. So, and, and thanks, Teddy, so for finding the money <laughs> for, for us to uh, actually get this done. So I just wanted to point out that, um, you know, I, I, I understand the concerns in the questions with regards to connectable devices as well. So yes, we need to have a minimum standard of what's minimally required for people to have that meaningful connectivity, right? But also, let me just, you know, remind us, because I feel like we are quickly getting into the how, that we are one of the countries, and this is actually a requirement by the United Nations that we have something called the Universal Service and Access Fund. South Africa actually has a Universal Service Fund called USASA, UWSASA, uh, -A, and uh, the, the role and responsibility of USASA is to collect money. It's actually funded through uh, profits coming from the mobile operators. Uh, I'm not sure what percentage South Africa is agreed on. I, I should really find out. But um, this money is there to ensure universal access. So where mobile operators are not able to go because it's commercially not viable, this fund actually partners uh, with entities in the sector to enable that connectivity. But we have seen progressive use of universal service funds across the board, not just globally but also in Africa, just next door to us in Botswana. Sorry, uh, Anika, I, for some reason, I think that's, we've so lost that's one you. Way that there you are, ensure, you're back. That's one way that you ensure access um, for people. Then the other way uh, we've seen in Ghana, for example, is beginning to, to subsidize handheld devices for uh, education. So they, they are, you know, we already have a structure that exists with a responsibility and a mission to ensure universal access. And it doesn't have to necessarily only fund infrastructure. It can also fund public access uh, connections through hotspots. It can also fund uh, devices. It can also fund digital skills development. And so for me, the issue is not really around the lack of resources, it's around how we are efficient um, with the use of existing resources to ensure that we reach uh, the requirements that's needed. Thank you very much for that. And uh, and yes, the, the comments coming from uh, coming from the viewers uh, is also very rapidly getting into the hows of it. And so we will uh, rapidly proceed that way um, after I give Martin a chance to respond. Uh, one other comment that came in from Jacques Juncker was, nothing can be free, unfortunately. All outputs require inputs. Things cost money or more generally resources because nothing can be created from nothing. Uh, uh, Martin, I wanted to give you an opportunity to respond uh, uh, to the, the audience uh, questions and comments we've received thus far, and specifically those two questions um, that, uh, that I've raised uh, to the other panelists. Um, con connected devices, uh, are those a human right as well? And how can we think about providing universal internet access uh, when uh, we can barely uh, provide some of the basic survival needs um, of some of the more vulnerable members of our society? Yeah, I think those two questions go right to the, the nub of the matter. And the first one uh, speaks very much to the slippery slope of uh, whereby if we start recognizing facilitators of our rights as rights in and of themselves, the laundry list of rights is virtually endless. Uh, it will keep going as time goes by. And it uh, unfortunately, resources are not unlimited. And uh, it, we will reach a point where government simply cannot provide those things. And I think that gets into the, the broader point of the how, which I'll uh, uh, slide into as I uh, conclude my remarks. Um, but uh, uh, the, the question of um, uh, our, the, the rights already contained in the constitution, which are already there that provide for a basic standard of living, we have seen that unfortunately our government has not been totally successful at achieving this. And I must uh, emphasize that at the turn, at the dawn of democracy, when South Africa came out of its very authoritarian past, uh, our government under the current ruling party did a remarkable job in, uh, in building houses, uh, rolling out infrastructure, uh, especially water and electricity infrastructure, a remarkable job. But we must remember that those years were years of not extreme economic growth, but respectable economic growth government was receiving the funds and there was enthusiasm from the private sector. Uh, uh, there may be concerns about the principle of the matter, but practically there was enthusiasm from the private sector to support government in uh, th those massive projects. That is 
the goodwill between the private sector and the public sector, even though it may still be said to be there, is gone uh, because of the problems that uh, my fellow panelists have pointed out, specifically corruption in this country. And I would like to finally be able to agree with all of my fellow panelists on something entirely. And that is that, yes, uh, um, part of solving uh, this problem and, and uh, a small part of uh, ex extending data and internet access to a lot of people would be to get rid of this uh, black hole of funds that exists at the heart of our public sector that see, sucks up uh, uh, necessary and scarce resources. Uh, but then uh, the, another question talked about the inequality uh, and distribution of unequal resources. And I think that's important because while it is absolutely true that there is an unequal distribution of resources in South Africa, our focus needs to be on the creation of wealth, on the creation of new resources because this existing pot of resources was during the previous regime created for a very very small population and that is not going to work for uh, our growing and our youthful population we need to grow the wealth pie and the way to do that is through economic freedom and we cannot see internet access and specifically the mob the data sector in isolation from the rest of the economy and allow me to be radical here and say that through policies that our government has unfortunately pursued that has strangled the economy, that has strangled the life out of our economy, uh, 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 disrespect for private property rights, threatening right now to really undermine private property rights, invasions of, uh, of civil liberties, uh, intense, intense regulation. And of course, we cannot admit discussing uh, how ESCOM has unfortunately recently totally failed at its singular job. Uh, and that has also led to economic ruin. We need economic freedom. We need government to step back, uh, to allow the economy to grow. And entrepreneurs, and I'm, I'm not referring to big white businesses. When I talk about the economy, I'm talking about the small guy, the entrepreneur, who just wants to start doing something, but who can't because of regulations and red tape. That needs to be gone. Uh, as we see in Europe, the driver of the economy is the small business, the one-man show, the 10-man show. We need to enable that. We need to move from a government-centric view of society, which unfortunately I think my fellow panelists to a large extent have, in that we see government as having to provide these things and government this and government that, to a civilian, uh, for lack of a better word, a citizen-centric society, whereby we trust each other and we enable each other to build these things for ourselves. And through doing that, economic growth will happen, job creation will happen, incomes will rise as they did for all race groups right after the end of apartheid when we were at our most free as a market, as a free market. Uh, since then, it's been more regulated, but that is when incomes really rose across all racial groups. Uh, and that hasn't uh, stayed. So we need a free market across the board. Uh, and that at the end of the day, as it has in the West, uh, as it has uh, in the East, especially, which is often not emphasized, has led to people rushing into the digital age with all vigor uh, and uh, with government then being able with the resources now available to provide these very important things. Uh, we cannot leapfrog. We cannot leapfrog over the necessity of having a free economy, of having an open economy, to a point where government, unfortunately, it appears magically, provides us with these things when taxpayers are leaving our shores in rows, when there is widespread disinvestment. It simply cannot happen. Otherwise, we're talking about a fantasy. And we should get off the fantasy and to the reality and say, let's grow the wealth by so that we can pay for what it is we are all agreed we need in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, there we've we've touched on the practicalities of making this happen. So uh, let's talk about uh, what it would take to to give people uh, access to the internet uh, and to to uh, to give South Africans universal access to the internet. Um, and so let's start with, uh, I, I had a question here uh, regarding just laying down some basic definitions. What does internet access mean? I think it's important for us to kind of have a basic agreement of terminology here. Um, and so where do you, where do you see that? Uh, is, it, is it purely, there's a cell tower near your house and, and you have, you know, that signal reaches you and you can connect 
uh, to the internet via that cell tower? Or does it, does it mean being able to afford data to use that cell tower? Does it mean being able to afford a device? Uh, does, it, does it mean, never mind cellular data, does it mean a fiber connection to your house? Is that access to the internet? So uh, state your, your opinion and, uh, in, in that regard. And then let's talk about um, the, the practicalities of making this happen. Whose responsibility is it to provide that access? And, uh, and then how does that happen? Uh, so Aisha Kaji uh, on, uh, from, uh, from the, the, the platform is saying, um, uh, one of our audience members is saying, in the same way that households get a minimum amount of water for free, government needs to enact legislation that a minimum degree of connectivity and data is available to households. That's one uh, approach that's suggested. Uh, and uh, so while we're at it, say whether that sounds reasonable to you or not. Uh, Chiliso, let's start with you um, and uh, let's take it away. Um, thanks. I'm glad you mentioned uh, water, uh, that uh, access to water is vital and the state has to provide water. And, and therefore, for me, I see issues of uh, internet access uh, and all the uh, accompanying uh, uh, appendages as, as, as vital as, as water. And, and therefore, we have to make sure that the basic uh, minimum uh, to enjoy this right is uh, affected by the state, um, and uh, and and uh, so you know, as some say, uh, tools of trade. I see access to internet and the accompanying uh, equipment around it as also tools of enjoying human rights. Uh, and I just want to say, you know, uh, we also need to take. A, I mean, we should. That there's one view about government. But you know, we are the government. We are the ones who elect governments. We are the ones who influence government to what kind of policies which we need in order to give effect to our rights. So that is a, a more progressive approach which we take about governance. Governance is not some big brother, big sister. We are the ones who determine those policies. So we should actually look at ourselves and make it very clear what kind of governance we want, which will best give effect to these rights, including the policies. And I think it's high time South Africans basically stand up and make these demands. And therefore we don't see government as, as, a, as, as, a, as a monster, but we see government as a facilitator of the people. And if government does not meet these rights, then it must be replaced by another government. As simple as that. Thank you for that. Uh, that, that, is, that is hard hitting. Um, and uh, while, uh, before I let you go though, so using water as an analogy, and this is perhaps simplistic and do call me on it if I'm straw manning it, but, um, uh, you know, it's one thing to talk about having a tap, uh, accessible access to it, you know, ex access, uh, access to a tap and running water, which a lot of communities in South Africa don't even have. But then, I mean, government doesn't supply cups or, or buckets or anything for you to, to, to drink the water out of or to carry it in or kettles to boil it in. Um, so uh, so in, in terms of internet access, um, it, it, the, do the same principles apply? So government's responsibility is to provide a certain level and then beyond that, it is the citizen's responsibility to make sure that they can use it. Thanks, each right has got its own requirements. So the right to water is different from the right to health. Uh, so uh, for health, uh, there are other things which government has to provide to give effect to that right. So the principle is this, we need to make sure that the rights are not hollow. So whatever is required to make the right of internet a meaningful right will be required, just like what we need to make the right to health as opposed to the right to water. Uh, so uh, I'm not an expert in IT, but certainly uh, my view is that internet must be made a right, and those who don't have the means must be given facilities to be able to access and enjoy that right. And there are standards which we then have to agree, and the government must work towards, towards that. And of course, they, our failure in the past 25 years to make sure that government delivers adequately in terms of water should then not stop us to push for government to do better uh, in this very important uh, right, which is very, very vital to the advancement of our country in the future. Because if we miss this highway, then we'll actually have greater difficulty in creating a necessary economic framework to be able to address even the rights of water. Thank you very much for that. And uh, just uh, to the audience, I wanna let you know, Kendall, Byron Ross, I see your comment. And June Knight, I see your comment. Um, I will uh, raise those with the panelists uh, in due course. Um, 
uh, before uh, uh, I just wanted to to give the, the panelists a, a chance to respond to this line of questions first. Uh, I wanted to see Lazola. Um, are you are you online? Are you able to hear us? And would you like to respond? Yes, I am online, and I would like to just give a short response. Thank you. Please go ahead. You are coming through loud and clear. All right. So, with regard to your question. Uh, what we have advocated for um, is that first and foremost, we should be able to, to have an affordable amount of data, just like um, the, the, the participant actually suggested, like an, an, a, the, the, they hand out a certain amount of water and electricity. So we had actually submitted to the Competition Commission that there should be an affordable amount of data that is allocated to the poorer um, uh, participants of democracy in the country, right? So that then facilitates the road to actually sell towers in each street that allow for the street to actually connect to it. And then that at least provides um, access, free access to internet to each of the streets. But the beginning of it all is that we need to recognize that um, the free access to internet is an essential need. And so to answer the question as to who should provide this, it should be the government, because in our social contract with the government, they are the ones that the custodians and they're the ones they're supposed to um, assist in helping us realize our essential needs, our fundamental needs. So first, we need to realize that internet, free internet access is not a privilege, it is an essential need. And then we can start having a conversation about who, which is the state, because if we're going to go into a citizen's uh, centric sort of perspective, then in, in South Africa, as the stats stand, we're going to rely on the rich, we're going to rely on the privileged, and they are going to also be the people who are going to be the primary writers of policies when it comes to using them this internet access. Hence why the importance is to ensure that the government as the essential um, stakeholder then pushes this um, um, sort of uh, affordable um, access to internet. Uh, cool. And and I'm going to put a pin in that. You, you've raised an important point, and I do want to circle back um, regarding a bunch of uh, questions regarding the practicalities of saddling government with this responsibility. Um, but before that, I wanted to give Onika a chance to respond to these questions. Um, and after that, Martin. Government is absolutely responsible uh, for ensuring um, access to the internet. So just to go to your question with regards to what connectivity and what this access to the internet. Um, so in this region, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people uh, still connect through mobile because um, we you know, don't have as much uh, broadband to the homes. But in terms of what we are beginning to advocate for, for a meaningful connectivity that uh, we want governments to adopt, it is, uh, we define it as regular access to the internet being uh, having daily access uh, to the internet. Uh, having an appropriate device, preferably a smartphone. It doesn't have to be uh, on the top end of the cost spectrum, but it could just be an entry-level smartphone that enables you and gives you the functionality uh, for you to be able to consume the content uh, and, and, and conduct business uh, online. Uh, it, you should ideally have enough data. Uh, at minimum, you know, if you have data at home, unlimited broadband uh, to the home or place of work. So your connectivity doesn't have to necessarily depend on being specifically at home, but if you're at work as well and you have access to connectivity, what we actually saw during COVID-19 stay at home orders is that the rate of people who had access to the internet actually went down because a number of people rely on that access uh, through uh, being at their jobs. And also speed, I think it's really important for us to talk about the quality of the connectivity so that uh, speed, uh, you know, at, 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 at least a 4G mobile uh, connection level as a minimum standard um, is, is one of the things that we need for government to look at as a, as a basic standard to build this digital economy and this 4IR revolution. Otherwise, it's just rhetoric and not something that will actually uh, be realized. Thank you very much. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Yeah, so given my diametrically uh, different uh, approach than the fellow panelists, I can say quite comfortably that I would regard internet access as being daily high speed, stable connection. I say that with a high degree of comfort and I think all people should ideally 
have that and I I have really uh, a true moral commitment to that happening. But given that I do not accept the, uh, the premise that it is in fact a human right, I think that we need to find a better way to achieve that point. And I think, uh, again, a little bit on the practicality is to look at the rest of the world and see how the prosperous societies got to where they were and uh, how uh, people in those countries have virtually 100% internet access. And to me, the answer is relatively simple. Uh, these countries, and I, I focus specifically on Europe, there's always this idea that Europe has always been this place where government has led the economy, this somewhat communist utopia. That has, of course, not been the case. Europe, for most of its history, uh, has had a quite a free economy where the uh, private sector, and again, that does not just refer to big corporates, but to you and uh, me, the street trader, where these people have the right to establish themselves, to engage in their own economic activity. This happened not over a matter of years, but over a matter of centuries that created the, uh, the wealthy middle class lifestyle that so uh, middle and upper class lifestyle that so many European and North American states enjoy that enabled today in the 21st century, these governments with a very strong and established economy to bring about what we know today as the European welfare state, whereby many things are provided by government, healthcare, et cetera, for education, for free to citizens. That is all built on the back of a strong economy. And unfortunately, and I say this with the greatest pain in my heart, I don't enjoy saying that we cannot afford it and therefore it's not a, or, and, and it's not a right. I don't enjoy that at all. It's simply a reality. We, can, we don't have that same base to jump up from and say, wow, people have, they don't have pit uh, toilets. Uh, people don't sit in dilapidating clinics uh, looking for healthcare. They don't live in shacks. They live in uh, uh, brick and mortar houses. We don't have that. We have an incredibly poor population. And because of the COVID-19 lockdown, it is going to get far worse than we were coming in. We are going to see millions potentially more unemployed receiving zero money. Uh, and that, that, that does not just mean that these big corporates or whoever the taxes to fund this, I'm sorry, but this fantasy that South Africa can provide free or even affordable internet access can come from. The, that money is, is go, it's leaving the country at best. And at worst, it is simply gone destroyed because of what has happened in South Africa, at least, uh, mostly over the last decade and a half-ish. So I, again, I must get back to that fundamental point. If, if this is what we want, and it is absolutely what we want, internet access, meaning the, the fiber connection to your house, to your cottage, to your flat, that is internet access. If that is what we want, we need a prosperous society. And if we, need a, if we want a prosperous society, we need to do the hard work, and that is to free the economy, cut red tape, pull government back, uh, and in, in the future, we can get to giving government a more activist role if we want. We're, we're simply not there. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and Martin, before I let you go, and, uh, and I, I want to come back to um, the, the question uh, that Lazola raised regarding, regarding government's role um, and which Onika uh, reinforced. So let's say that we as South Africa do not want to wait for this uh, capitalist utopia to arrive where we, um, you know, our economy is strong and, and we have uh, this, this tremendous base on which to build a similar kind of welfare state as, as Europe has. Um, and so let's say, okay, well, we've got these mobile networks right now. Um, uh, let's see if we can get something to people in the meantime. Um, uh, what, what does that look like in terms of government's, uh, government's role? Would you, for example, be open to uh, tax cuts to Vodacom and MTN and the like to fund a, a basic amount of data? Or do you think that basic amount of data uh, on, on mobile networks um, is untenable at best. And while we're at it, what about the anti-competitive uh, concerns over that? Should that basic amount of data only be if you're on Vodacom, MTN, Cell C, uh, um, Telcom, or on uh, virtual private networks that, that run on those networks? Or what about uh, wireless ISPs and, um, and other WISPs um, uh, 
uh, that run over Wi-Fi and uh, uh, and standard, you know, ADSL or fiber ISP, should we get a basic amount of data there? Uh, your thoughts on that uh, before I let you go? Yeah. So look, if we're talking practicalities, then I think absolutely something like that can be considered. There are, uh, it, it's definitely absolutely not going to lead to total free internet access for all 55 million to 60 million of us, but it may be a start. And I'm, I wouldn't say give tax cuts to only the big corporates. I'm very much in favor of giving tax cuts to absolutely everyone. Um, but uh, the trade-off there, I think, which uh, may or may not be agreed to by the panelists, is called a voucher system. And that is whereby government uh, agrees to pay for data uh, for uh, X amount of rand per citizen. But the, the, the thing that government will need to let go of is regulation and management. So no more uh, government-owned uh, companies in ICT, uh, no more uh, regulation of uh, private uh, ISPs, uh, of, of uh, MNOs, that will all need to go. But in exchange for that, because now with the less regulation, there is gonna be more economic activity. There is gonna be more profit and more profit means more taxes. That will enable government to provide each citizen uh, I, don't, I don't have a number. It's not going to be uh, as high as we might like it to be, but it would provide the government with that opportunity to go to each citizen and say, here is your voucher, your internet access voucher. You can use that to purchase uh, internet access from an I, a private ISP of your choice. Uh, and uh, there you have it. You can have fiber, whatever you want. The money is yours. You get to use it on internet access. That is a trade-off that I am I'm quite happy with. What I'm not happy with, and that is what our government has not learned from the European states and from the United States, for, ex for instance, is that you cannot have, especially not at our level of development, you cannot have a welfare state and a regulatory state at the same time. You have to choose one. If you want a welfare state, you need to get rid of uh, stringent regulation so you can pay for the welfare state. And if you want a regulatory state, then you need to get rid of the, the welfare state so that uh, there could be money to, that, that compensates for the economic activity that the regulations squeeze out. Uh, so I am fine with a, a practical trade-off like that, but it needs to be a trade-off rather than having your bread buttered on both sides. Thank you for that. Uh, Lazola, it'd be great to, to have your input on, on that because you mentioned that government should be responsible for this. Um, so how do, you, how do you see that happening? Are you, are you happy with the kinds of uh, solutions uh, that we're talking about? Um, I am happy with the kind of solutions uh, that we're talking about, but I definitely think that seeing that happening begins with government and network providers and our regulators working together. And I say this because the government can ensure that regulations that force network providers to actually um, allow for data to be free, for a certain number, for them to provide a certain amount of data to be free. And our regulators can ensure that that is possible because that's what was not, that's what, that's what got us to a point where, for instance, we had high data costs because before the concessions that were made by MTN and Vodacom, this year in April, uh, what we had is that South Africa was being charged the highest amount of data within Africa. So for instance, in Tanzania, we had one gig data Vodacom being um, 99, 99 Rand and in South Africa, 150. So from the report from the Competition Commission and the research that we did, we realized that it's these three parties that are working together. So if we can have these three parties actually working together and with divided roles, then we can be able to realize a situation where we have practical, where we practically have um, a free accessible internet. So I think when we're involving the government, the most important thing is one, speak about the finances that they have to actually take out because we do know that the government does have a lot of amount of money. It's aside from the taxes that are needed, aside from anything, but the privileges that um, the, the government uh, officials uh, also enjoy can be sacrificed. They can be given back to the people because it is a democratic 
government. It's not a Republican government. It's not a capitalist government. It shouldn't be, according to the um, Freedom Charter, according to our uh, democratic country founding documents. So this, this can be done if it's not only put on the burdens of civil society, private companies, and the citizens. If the government also comes to the fore, it can actually be done through the government, our regulators, and our service providers, because it's important for service providers that operate in a country to recognize that they must fulfill and play an important and play a fair role in the social economic demographic of the country. Thank you very much, Chiliso. I see that hand, and certainly I was coming to you next. Uh, so please go right ahead. Uh, you're not coming through there for some reason. Uh, you are unmuted, but I don't hear you. Uh, yeah, that's strange. Uh, <laughs> oh no. Um, uh, uh, please, please go ahead and see if you can troubleshoot um, the microphone on your end. I don't know if maybe your the battery of your uh, things have died. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Well, I can hear okay, you loud and clear now. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, maybe to Martin, as a, as a constitutional lawyer, we have a bit of a challenge. Uh, first of all, I think we all agree, uh, including Martin, that we do need to find an appropriate solution to this problem. It's of vital importance in many aspects. But now, from a constitutional point of view, we have Section 7 of our Constitution, which clearly states that it is the responsibility of the state to promote and protect and fulfill human rights. So what is important really for us is how do we ensure that the government creates a conducive environment for this right to be realized in how it regulates or it does not regulate and in how it uses private sector and how it manages the economy? And that's actually where the focus should be because we cannot say the state has not, should not play a role. The state at this point in time is the most appropriate entity in our country in the context of our political history and everything else. Unfortunately, you know, unlike Europe, we never had 30 years of exploiting other continents to become rich. So we have to start from where we are. Secondly, we're inheriting a country with so much inequalities where 70% of Black South Africans live in poverty. So how will they get access if we're going to rely on, uh, on, on capital? So we need to find uh, the balance uh, between uh, all the streams to make sure that we do give effect. So the state still has that responsibility. Maybe it's our fault that we are not pushing government to come up with more smart policies in how this right could be uh, given uh, effectively and also grow the economy as well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Annika, I would like to give you the, the last word on this particular point, and then I will move us on to uh, the, the closing part of uh, the discussion today. Um, you know, since we've talked a lot about the economy and and it's depend and things depending on the economy, I think it's really important for us, since we are talking about the internet, to note that the future of even our own economy is digital. And therefore, in order for us to have these aspirations of uh, economic growth, we have to participate in the fourth industrial revolution where the, the bulk of the economy is going to be coming from. We are already seeing like most countries, a decline in traditional sources of revenue like mining uh, for countries like Nigeria, all revenues are declining, but the sector that is actually growing in all of those economies is the mobile telephony uh, sector. So how do we prepare the future innovator? How do we prepare the future business entrepreneurs of South Africa, the Bongane, in Atchlichville who has to go to a hotspot in order to connect is by making sure that they have the minimum access to that's required for them to participate in that economy as well because the economy is not just for those who are in business only it's also for those who are aspiring a future in you know participating in that business it's for consumers too so when we talk about not regulating the sector it also becomes quite problematic because the regulator is not there just to only regulate business but they're also there to regulate for consumer protection and we have seen that when we have a regulation a regulator that is not 
as um, you know, Adam, uh, active in regulating the sector, we ended up with a situation uh, where we did not ha have competition and actually uh, the cost of access was quite inaffordable. I mean, Lazola just gave us an example with Tanzania, but quite frankly, even today with the concessions made by MTN, South Africans are paying 99 rands per gig of data. Nigeria, MTN, 99 rands gives you 4.5 gigs of data. So, you know, there's still a long ways that we need to go uh, and it requires both government, civil society and uh, private sector to come to the party to ensure that we have uh, affordable and meaningful access for everyone. Thank you very much for that. And uh, on the topic of MTN Nigeria versus MTN South Africa, I know MTN has given comment to the effect of, uh, and I don't want to get bogged down in the te technical aspects of it. I know folks are um are, are probably quite tired of hearing the mobile operators cry about spectrum but certainly mtn has highlighted that it has uh, like probably quadruple the amount of spectrum in nigeria than it has in south africa and uh, we're slowly seeing that problem allevi alleviated here in south africa and hopefully they can deliver on that promise uh, more spectrum means lower prices uh, that's what they promised and so hopefully yeah. when that happens Anika, do you want to add something <laughs> let me just quickly interject on <laughs> that i mean this complaint on spectrum is something we are very used to anytime we talk about cost of data. The reality of it is that the conversation about spectrum, spectrum is directed at government, but it's consumers who are complaining about data, right? So it's really a very, it's a really nice way to shift focus on, 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 on an issue. But let's just look at what, look at what recently happened. Vodacom, uh, and I, I'm not sure if MTN, but they were given uh, free spectrum in response to COVID-19 to help us deal with congestion and and the heavy demand. What happened during that time? Vodacom actually launched 5G. I mean, I don't remember in the conversation uh, when they were being given the spectrum and the speeches that were made, 5G being part of the conversation. You know, and yes, maybe there is a way that 5G kind of alleviates some of the traffic, but the reality of it is that that spectrum was to alleviate congestion and deal with our bandwidth with issues that continued while they were launching 5G Spectrum because most of us don't even have 5G devices, <laughs> you know? So I, I think that's a separate conversation, but I mean, uh, and a good example to show that we need a regulator who regulates the sector and the behavior of the corporations. Mm. And and I would love to get into the technical aspects, but as you say, I think that is a separate discussion. Um, for right now, I would like to give everybody an opportunity to make a closing statement after uh, I read a couple of uh, 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 messages from the audience. An important question that I did not get around to um, was raised by Kendall Byne Ross, who asked, is there a way to make certain types of websites accessible without data, uh, make it make them available for free? It's called zero rating in the industry. Perhaps um, learning institutions, websites, social media, and news websites can be free, for example. So quick comment from me, that is starting to happen uh, in response to COVID-19. Um, in fact, uh, the, some disaster management regulations obligated the mobile network operators and other ISPs to make some of these websites freely available. Um, um, uh, if uh, you wish to use uh, your closing argument panelists uh, to address this issue, a question I wanted to add to this is what about anti-competitive concerns when it comes to zero rating? Uh, is that something that a developing nation such as ourselves should be worried about? Um, or or uh, should we just make WhatsApp free, make, um, you know, uh, allow zero rating as, as widely as possible just so that people can get access to services? And then a comment from June Knight who said, what if we see access to the internet as something that could solve some of our other problems? Access to the internet means that all students, no matter where they are located, can access quality education, lectures that could be live streamed. Imagine nurses and clinics in rural areas being able to access healthcare information and meet with specialists when needed. I'm worried that the approach of this discussion is looking at how to limit what people are able to access instead of opening it up further than what we currently have. We have an opportunity to create something better and then Bulelani and Dinwa uh, said, we need a model specific to South Africa and its diverse, unequal society. We can't look to European countries for direction. Th their models are not designed to address our, our unique situation. And uh, perhaps, Chaliso, uh, I'm going to start with you um, so you can make your closing statement and uh, then we'll move on. Thank you. As Nelson Mandela said, it's in our hands 
to make sure that our country and as many people join uh, this digital economy. And therefore, we need to push the state as well as uh, other companies, the private sector, to ensure that we as a country uh, do maximize our contribution involvement in the digital divide. I do agree, uh, digital divide can also help people in rural areas. So can we imagine, for example, if you have, you don't have to go to a bank anymore, you can do banking uh, through internet from a rural village. Uh, what will it mean for the economy? Uh, so Sasa grants, for example. It's in our hands, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Lazola, I would like to uh, throw, it, uh, throw it to you to make a closing statement. Um, thank you very much. I think, um, one, I'd just like to briefly uh, respond to the comment and, and yours and then summarize that. I think the most important thing is that we've come fairly far now with um, zero rated sites from network operators. Um, the one thing that we need to now make sure is happening um, is that all government sites are free and we move to a point where public hospitals and public schools are also free because the, the sites, because now um, applications are based online. So if we can move to that point, at least we can begin to have zero rated sites. And the most important thing um, is that since uh, the MTN and Vodacom uh, publicized zero rated sites, we need those to be more publicized and be seen and known by the public because from then we still have questions coming into the Right to Know campaign about people asking, where are these sites? What are these sites? So we need those publicized. And in terms of um, uh, concerns on zero rating, I think that if we look at the conversation on zero rating as um, having essential services and essential sites as zero rated, then we avoid having the conversation on concerns around it. Otherwise, if we move on to the commercial, uh, having a commercial sites zero rated, then we're going to run into an issue where smaller networks or local networks are excluded um, from actually providing uh, a service and making a profit and have mega companies like your Google and your Facebooks then, because they have chump change, then giving um, uh, free services via zero rating. But in closing, I do agree um, with the fellow panelists that uh, we do need to push the government push civil society and push ourselves as citizens to join campaigns and to join stances whereby we are pushing our stakeholders to provide free accessible internet, fast internet, just like Onika actually highlighted that it's very important. And we need to participate in conversations where we're given opportunities to um, give policy advancements and give policy comments. Thank you very much. Onika, the floor is yours. Yes, certainly. So, um, you know, South Africa, um, I think we all agree that we, we have a huge challenge in terms of dealing and addressing the inequality in our society. And so the, the digital divides that exist are not necessarily unique to just the internet. They are basically a reflection of what our society really is. So if we see uh, this as a huge challenge in society, in our offline lives, then it definitely uh, is mirrored in the online uh, digital space. So I'm not a big fan of zero rating. I, I really appreciate that the uh, companies have come to the party and zero rated uh, school websites and, and the different content. I, you know, and may, perhaps that's where we start. But ultimately, I would like to have citizens be able to have minimum allowance of digital access and have them make the determination of how best to utilize those allowances, similar to what the citizens of Tswane had when they still, uh, the good old days of the Tswane uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, because for me, that's really about universal access, but it's also, you know, sort of moving away from this, you know, nanny state mentality to actually understanding that we are dealing with citizens who are empowered to also take a role in directing how they learn uh, online. So, so it's really important that uh, we continue to have these conversations, but most importantly, it's, it's important that government plays its role by regulating the sector, not just for competition. Uh, as you mentioned, the space has been found to be quite anti-competitive, but also to ensure, um, you know, digital consumer rights. We, we live in a country where consumers who pay the same exact amount to MTN and Vodacom uh, get different quality connectivity if they are in Stanton than when they're in Soweto. In fact, when they're in Soweto, they are forced to have one or two different 
SIM cards in order to make sure that they've got better connectivity in front of their house uh, with one network and behind their house uh, with another network. So we are uh, beginning to see upper state of service uh, within the sector as well. And it's really important that we fight for universal uh, access that is equal for everyone and, and everyone can be able to afford it. Thank you very much uh, for your closing comments, Onika. Uh, Martin, I'm going to give you uh, the last word. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so the entire field of economics can be summed up in this phrase. There is no such thing as a free lunch. That is economics at the beginning and that is economics at the end. June Knight's comment and this idea of zero rating, those things sound great. And I think especially what June said, that is something that we want to eventually see in society and we should all embrace that. But all those things will cost money. Data and uh, the, the thing you see on your screen does not fall out of the ether from the cloud. People actually have to work to project that image onto your screen. People have to be paid to do that. And money is not an infinite resource. There is huge potential in South Africa. The government white paper of uh, power, energy white paper of 1998, for instance, uh, proposed demonopolizing ESCOM and allowing private entrance into the sector. That never happened. And the multitudes of foreign companies that lined up to come in, create jobs, create infrastructure, and make what we've since experienced as load shedding, something that never would have happened, that simply went away because government ideology Ideolo ideologically could not commit to privatization, that swear word. Um, and as a result, we've had load shedding, we've had economic contraction over the last few years and, and very, very little economic growth, if any. These limited resources that we already have in South Africa have been leaving. The, 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 the existing pie is shrinking. At some point, there will be nothing left and all this talk about free data access to the internet will be moot. Section 195 of the constitution obliges the civil service to make effective and efficient use of, of existing scarce resources. That is a provision of the constitution that our government has ignored from the word go. And that is unfortunate because had it not ignored that, then we could have had a grown economy today. We could have, we had, this discussion wouldn't have been necessary because we would have had a huge middle class. We would have had a bigger upper class. The existing inequalities would have been virtually gone if government had just adhered to this simple principle. And if I'm allowed to just end on a slightly positive note, South Africa is not a total basket case when it comes to internet access. 52, 53% sounds low. And in fact, it, 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 it kind of is, it's not ideal, but we are in the top half of countries around the world, or at least we were in 2016, as a per percentage of the population that have internet access. Countries like the Ukraine in Europe, Tunisia, North Africa, uh, Mexico, Thailand, Mauritius, a fellow African country of a far higher uh, per capita uh, GDP than South Africa, all have smaller online populations than South Africa. We can do better, but the culprit that has caused our total collapse, government, is not going to be part of that solution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to my panelists for an excellent discussion tonight. Uh, a wide, diverse range of views, and I hope uh, that everybody uh, viewing this today uh, found that as educational as I did. Um, I would like to thank Onika Makwakwa, who is from the Alliance for Affordable Internet, where she leads the multi-stakeholder engagement across Africa. Advocate Seliso Tipanyane, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the South African Human Rights Commission. Thank you. Lazola Kati is the National Campaigner on Communication Rights for the Right to Know campaign. Thank you for your contributions. Martin van Staden is the Head of Legal at the Free Market Foundation. Thank you for your contributions. Uh, thank you all again for taking the time tonight to share your experience and your views. Um, uh, for for the folks uh, who were not able to tune in, uh, please uh, please share. Everybody who's watching right now, please share this video so that those who were not able to tune in tonight are able to see this important discussion among such an expert panel uh, out there. There will be a video available on YouTube as well tomorrow, so you can share that link in addition to the Facebook link. Um, there's a link for people to sign up to the newsletter where they can get updates on all critical dialogues. Please sign up to that. 
Uh, our thanks again to the Cornerstone Institute, which made this evening possible. Cornerstone is a private, not-for-profit higher education institution in Cape Town. I've been Jan Vermeulen. You can find me on Twitter and most of my work on my broadband. Good night. <laughs>